Alright. All right. What we got here, we're going to be playing around with some axle diagnosis. And uh, you guys, I'm going to flip off the lights for better stuff so don't go to sleep. And all that. And uh, what we're looking at here is uh, if you got sounds that appear to be coming from an axle, you need to be thoroughly investigated before adjustments are made. Now, what we did, uh, there was a uh, 2003 Ford Explorer that we worked on. They had a bunch of racket coming out of the rear axle, and we definitely, we put our chassis ear on there, and we heard all kinds of uh, noise coming out of the, the center chunk. And basically, we pulled it apart and put gears, and, you know, we put uh, bearings in it because they were all brittle and everything. You could tell it was bad. Still had noise back there, and it turned out the hub bearings were bad, too. I mentioned that, I think, last semester. I don't know exactly. They don't even swimming in the same wall because they got CV axles going out there. But one way or another, every bearing on the back of that thing was bad. Uh, but you got to make sure before you go back there working on the rear end that that's what's going on with it. Is that the one that had the bad ground cable? No, that can cause that, but it wasn't that one. I checked it for that, but that wasn't what was going on. Uh, okay, so you got this six-step troubleshooting procedure, basically, uh, that you're going to have here. Verify the complaint. Drive it make sure you get it doing it. You know, if you just go flying there working on it and you haven't verified the complaint, you're in a mess. you got to verify related symptoms. Let's say, I'm actually hearing something here and I'm actually feeling something through the floorboard and I've actually got something else going on too that may be tied in with all this. Analyze the symptoms and sort of think this thing through. Isolate the condition. Basically what you're going to do is say, okay, the reason that we're hearing a noise here is because we have loud bearings in the rear ends, more on the left side than the right side. Service the condition. That's basically do your adjustment or change your bearing or whatever and then you verify the adjustment. So basically, that's how I go. Before you can do anything, you're going to have to verify the complaint. If you don't do that, you're, you're your own worst enemy. And a lot of people just throw stuff together, when, you know, throw parts in it and say, well, I know how to replace the part, and they don't want to be dealing with this troubleshooting thing that's really aggravating. They have to try to go behind somebody that, that did that. When I, sometimes when I would get a vehicle, when I was working at the Ford place, it would come from another place. I would have to not only figure out what was wrong with it, I'd have to undo everything they did to make it run right. <laughs> Because they, you know, I can see that they put the distributor in a tooth out, and they did all kinds of stuff on the head and took apart and, and that kind of thing. All right, so operate the vehicle the same way the customer said produce the condition, whether or not a sound is detected. And as I say, I'm driving 48 miles an hour uphill between here and Doc's Country Store. I'm here in this racket, so I'm going to go 48 miles an hour uphill between down here and Doc's Country Store. And it's a, if, if you can, it's best to simulate the, all the conditions would, would be the temperature and everything. As close as you can come to those because a lot of the times everything has to be just right before this condition will appear. All right, so road test speed ranges 25, 35, 45, 55, 65 and above. Now if you're going, if you're, if you're driving too fast and you get a ticket, then the shop is not going to pay that. Everybody knows that, right? And one day there was this state trooper guy that was like a uh, revenue enforcement guy. He wore a uniform that was light blue and light blue. I mean, you know, not, you know the state troopers in Alabama wear, you know, a light, uh, light blue shirt, or I mean, gray pants and a blue shirt, or whatever. He was wearing his shirt and his pants were all the same color, but he had a, an Alabama state troopers thing on there. He wanted me to drive his car because he said it would, it would top out about 105, and he was thinking it ought to go faster than that. And so I said, well, I'm not going to drive that fast unless you're in a car with me. So we headed off up toward Headland, you know, with him sitting over here. And as I was sitting about 100 miles an hour. And he goes, be careful. Sometimes there will be a trooper sitting up here. <laughs> Basically, I'm driving his car. I would have got a ticket him with him sitting there with me. Is what he was telling me, you know. But uh, anyway, road test drive mode, light drive, float, heavy drive. Floats when you're just basically holding your feet, right? Heavy drive is when you're pushing it hard. You coast and cruise, you know what I'm saying. So basically, you've got to have all those little uh, ways you're going to do it. That's your, those are your different speed range, ranges, and that's your different drive modes. You know, you've, everybody's done those, but well, this is not rocket science. you got to inspect the wheel and tire assemblies for damage or uneven wear. All four tires should be the same brand, model, and size if you're working on something like that. So basically, if you've got a bunch of mismatched tires, you can do that. What would be the problem? What kind of problem do you have in a drive line? I don't care if it's front wheel or rear wheel drive. Well, let's say somebody has got a... Uh, you know, these tires that are like uh, a size bigger on one side of the vehicle than they are the other because he got one from Joe Bob's, uh, you know, tire pit or whatever. Any uh, spider gears? The spider gears are just working like a son of a gun because you got one tire rolling faster than the other. 
if you're changing, I always tell people a lot of times they don't know this, if you're driving a front wheel drive car, you better not put the donut on the front. Because it's, you know, the front wheel drive uh, transaxle is not as robust as that rear one. And it'll tear it all to pieces if you're not careful. It's not quite so bad on an American car as it is on some of these little Honda cars and stuff. But you put a little donut on the front, you're supposed to put, uh, always have both ones on the front. Like if you have a flat on the front, you're supposed to move the one from the back to the front and put the donut on the back. What you're basically supposed to do. Anyway, well, let's go here. So basically, you're, this is the, this not here looking at the tires and wheels and all that kind of stuff. These aren't the greatest pictures in the world because we got them out of no publication. Okay, change the engine speed by switching the overdrive on and off. You can do that. You can also tap the brake on a lot of cars and it releases the torque converter clutch. You can watch your tachometer. When you tap the brake, you'll see it go up and then if so, it come back down. You know, and so, so on and so forth. Okay, so basically if you, you know, if you do that, you can actually change your engine speed. I tell you, if I've got an idea that I've got a, you know, like a, a, a rear end, whenever it's making noise, will make noise loaded, but it won't make noise coasting sometimes and all that. But if I got the idea that it may not be gear issues or maybe something else, I'll, or if I don't know what it is, I'll kick it up in neutral and switch off the car and let it coast and see what I hear. You know, because sometimes if the noise goes away, it may be something engine related or whatever. Uh, repeat the drive mode and speed range and test. You know, these uh, right here, the, the font that we use to build this in there in the class, in, the, in there is slightly different than what I got on mine. So some of these words will run off the page. All right. Sounds that change with engine speed may be related to the engine and the exhaust and transmission or something like that. Now, one of the things that we used to do when we were doing noise vibration and harshness stuff and I was working at the Ford dealer, if we had what they would call like a body boom where it felt like the whole body was vibrating for some reason or another, a lot of times you could loosen all the motor mounts and loosen the exhaust system where it connects to the engine and then rock the engine back and forth on all its cradles and everything, let it find where it wants to be. And then a lot of times that would take care of that. Now, what would happen if I went over here, I'm going to do something really quick right here. If I go over here and I take her hat and I put it back on, it looks the same, doesn't it? But Amber, does it feel right? No, it doesn't. <laughs> You, know, I mean, you can take somebody's hat off their head and put it back on, and they are not going to let it stay there. They're going to fix it where it feels right to them, because I can't tell how it's going to feel right. Now, that's the way this exhaust system was, these motor mounts. They have somewhere they want to be, and if you got them bound up, then you got issues. You know what I mean? That may or may not fix it. maybe may be a little trouble to do it. Sometimes if you've got motor mounts that have got rocks and dirt and stuff crammed up in them, kind of like the rocks that were in that shifter, then it'll cause vibration to be felt to the body. You get a look up where you see a bunch of rocks crammed into the motor mount where that rubber's not doing its job. Get the rocks and stuff out of it and see how it does. You know, sometimes the motor mounts get flabby and soft and get to where they're not doing their job. And you gotta replace motor mounts just to get that rid of that, you know, that jiggle. Alright, so if the sound changes with the engine, and now look at that. We got a the engine speed and related to the engine exhaust the transmission, not the axle. So basically if the engine speed changes the sound, then you got uh, problem somewhere else besides your rear axle. Look for components that might be loose or grounded in contact with other components. It's kind of what I was talking about a minute ago. If it's touching something, you're basically going to have it. This one goofy guy, uh, when I was over there, there was a Jeep that was brand new that he was reading because we had the Jeep uh, franchise too when I was over at the dealer that for a long time. And uh, it was making a racket. It was an exhaust rattle. He put a 2 by 4 in there. You know, but you know, you can tell he has some really good training, right? Uh, with a vehicle on a hoist, Check for any loose or grounded items such as suspension or exhaust system components that might contribute to the sound. This is a noise, vibration, and harshness thing. Other components can contribute to the cause of sound complaints. You know, just about anything that you can imagine will cause that. Uh, sometimes you'll, you know, be listening to one sound that seems to be coming from over here and it's coming from the opposite corner of the car. One of the things that will throw you for a loop more than anything else is you'll just swear up and down you have a bad wheel bearing on the left front and it'll turn out it'll be somewhere else. My aunt's Crown Victoria came in here, and I would have absolutely sworn she had a bad rear axle bearing. It was a 92 Crown Vic. And we drive that thing, you could swerve it back and forth, and it get really noisy when you loaded it. You know, when you turn it to the right, it would load the left. And I mean, I would have sworn in a court of law that the left rear axle bearing was shot. This way it takes. And we got that thing on the lift, and we took the cover off the back, we pulled the axle out, that bearing was pristine, it was perfect and all that, and it turned out she had a bad tire. And it was in the front, not in the back. The tire in the front sounded like a bad axle bearing in the back. So be aware of the fact that it, things aren't always as they seem when you're hunting noises because there's a lot going on on those cars. All right. Other, or other areas other than the axle can contribute to sound concerns, including 
other driveline components, the engine and exhaust, and things like suspension and body components. All right, so uh, a howl is a low frequency to medium frequency, may range in pitch. You know, and you hear some, you know, whenever you're, you can hear them gears sound like they're mismatched or they're out of, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, backlash or the pinion depth not be right or something like that. Or you can just have gears that are bad. Now, I've said this before when we were in manual transmission, you can have gears that look good that sound bad. So you won't always be able to look at a gear and tell it's a bad gear. It'll be, it may look just as smooth and pretty as anything you've ever seen. Now one guy, and this sounds like a, a Jonathan Price thing, this one guy over there, there was a big, there was whining, howling gears on the rear end at the Ford place over there. And this one guy named Buford that would come over there to work, he's, he's long, he's passed away now. But he used to come to work, one day he'd come to work with grease on his nose that was on there when he left work the day before. I don't know if he didn't take a bath or whatever, or never even looked in the mirror. But he jacked that truck up and he pulled the cover off of it and he smeared a lot of, uh, of uh, valve grinding compound on the gears. And he let it sit there and just idle with those gears turning through for about five or six hours. And then whenever he cleaned all that stuff out of there and put it back together with oil in it, it was just as quiet. <laughs> He basically lapped and matched those gears in using a valve grinding compound in a lot of time. You know, which is sort of a novel concept, you know, but I mean, it's just crazy. Also, the people that use car people used to put bananas in there and it would make me hip quiet, you know. But, all right, so uh, if it's torque sensitive, it might be accompanied by a vibration. A howl is usually associated with excessive run out of rotating components. Okay, so basically, if you got a growl, which is different from a howl, it's a low frequency sound that's nearly constant in intensity. It's not a torque sensitive thing, it's always making the same racket. That's going to be bearings usually. Um, look at her, she says a bearing tissue. You know, see how she's automatically typing so fast on that? Low frequency, constant intensity, less than torque, less torque sensitive, and it happens at all speed ranges if you've got a bad bearing typically. Now you can swerve back and forth and find it. The third type of axle sound is a whine, which is a high frequency sound with a sharp metallic quality. Uh, and speed, load sensitive and speed sensitive, typically. Okay, so snap-on kits YA321 and YA2340 contain the sealing plugs of the transfer case output when the rear prop shaft is removed. Whoopee. I mean, you know, you can basically do something yourself on that. You can put a, a latex, I mean, a uh, natural glove over it, so that ain't even a big deal. All right, so... Uh, axle inspection and analysis, all of the essential tools required for axle service. Uh, basically, you, you need these, you basically, there was a, is this particular box of tools right here was one that they sent to all of the Jeep dealers because back in the, uh, in the and part of what launched this presentation here was back in the late 90s and early 2000s, the, uh, the apparently, and I'm just surmising here, the machines that they were using to make the rear axle assemblies were wearing out and were out of calibration a little and there was a lot of Jeeps that had a had noise in the rear end because of it and I, the, the 2001 Cherokee that I drove had noise in the rear end the whole time I drove it and I put 150,000 miles on it and it had noise the whole time I drove it because of that and I didn't go to the trouble when it was still under warranty to go back and have them you know fix it but they had a whole box full of tools in a toolbox that looked like one of these little red ones we got out here that came to the dealership for that purpose, you know, for actually just working on the rear end. Kind of like the stuff that we got here now. I've got these uh, tools that I'm going to show you guys how to take the axles and, you know, set them up like we showed, talked about before. All right. Now, chronometer and dial caliper, you usually make your different measurements during axle adjustment repairs. We got those right here. I got a, a kit of those that's right there. This is in a box around here that I carry with me usually. Uh, inch pound and foot pound torque wrenches got to be used. The object of the axle inspection is to gather complete information about the axle to determine whether there's a gear bearing or run out issue within the differential. This kind of torque wrench or that kind of torque wrench, those are the kind you need to use. You will not use a click type torque wrench whenever you're, use, whenever you're working on a rear axle because you're basically you're going to have to use this like an indicator needle to see uh, how you have to, how much, like for instance, when you're setting up your preload, you need to know how much it takes to keep it turning. You can't do that with a click type torque wrench. You've got to use one of these. Or you can use a digital one, I think, but I, I really like the needle ones better. All right, to start out, remove the differential cover uh, from the axle that's making the noise. Inspect the condition of the fluid. Look for metal or anything like that. You can see things a lot of times. Look for uh, anything that's going on in there that if you see gritty stuff in there or you see uh, sparkly stuff or you see chunks of metal, that's a pretty good way to 
uh, look at that. Um, I will tell you that we had a uh, an F-150 in here one time. It was a 98 model. It had bad spider gears in it. It was all busted up in there. And so we all it needed was spider gears. And we bought a set of spider gears for that thing from the dealer for $65. And about a month later, we had a Chevrolet that came in here. And it needed spider gears the same way. And they were $550. Which I don't know why the big disparity in price. Because they looked about like the same gears. You know, yeah, I don't know why it would cost so much more to make them. Or why GM was costing so much. But anyway, tip the dial indicator plunger against the tooth on the ring gear. You guys might have seen this before. You pull that cover off of there, you can set that dial indicator real easy, and you're going to measure backlash. That's how much movement there is. You got to lock that front gear where it cannot turn and it cannot move in any way, shape, or form, and you're measuring to see how much of this don't, 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 don't. You need to know how much is there. If you don't have enough, you got problems. If you got too much, you got problems. Uh, total turn and torque measurement. Measure and record the total turning torque with an inch pound torque wrench. Now you did that on yours, on that red Ford that you got, whenever it, you know, we had found out that thing was loose. Right, and he still got little boys coming out of the rear end, but looking in there, you don't really see anything. Gear contact pattern check. That might be something you could do on that one. You paint some white grease or some something on those gears and turn them through just to see how they show, you know. And that's something we didn't do when we were in, you know, doing it the other day. Uh, rotate it through. It makes the gear contact pattern visible because it makes a mark on there. And I got some, now you saw those in that other presentation I gave last time, you know, the, the gear contact stuff. And so your gear contact pattern check, see how that one there looks right there, how they got it. And right here, right there in the middle of that gear is where it's supposed to be making contact. If it's up here or down here or off the head or too deep, you can tell by looking at that contact pattern. It's really good. And you can basically evaluate it typically by looking at that. It's not that difficult to set up a rear end if you go in there with the idea that you understand what you're doing. And basically pinion depth and backlash, that chart uh, that, I, that I showed you guys before, I can actually give you a handout on that so it'll tell you what to do to fix the various different pattern stuff. Okay, you got to use a spreader, which we got one of those over here, to spread the housing just a little bit, no more than like 20 thousandths of an inch. All right. The next step is to pull the pinion gear and compare the match numbers. Now, some of them have got match numbers on them, and some of them don't. You can't always go by that. But they're supposed to have, on this the Chrysler ones, they're supposed to have the same number here that they got there. If somehow or another they mixed them up and they put the wrong ones, you know, they put mismatched gears in there, then that may be uh, a problem because it's going to be noisy. According to the thickness of the pinion depth shim, the pinion depth shim is the one that's between you know, the pinion, depth, the pinion gear is that cone-shaped gear that actually interacts with the ring gear. So when you push the bearing off of that gear, there will be a pinion depth shim there, and you need to measure that. Uh, now, the tools that we got over here is basically tells you how to find out what the, what the right one is for that differential. The reason you have to do this is because these are critical dimensions, and not every housing is the same. And so basically, you have to make it, you know, you got to match it. So that's what the pinion depth them I assume is. So keeping track of that is pretty important, unless you're starting from scratch. You know, then you got to find out what it's supposed to be. Okay. Check the bearing races and their I mean, uh, bearing and the races for damage or excessive wear. You basically going to be looking at that stuff. Let me see who this is. That's Brett. We got a time here right now. All right. So run out measurement. With the carrier in the housing, measure and record the carrier run out of the ring gear flange. This is when you've taken the ring gear off, you've mounted the carrier in there, and you're basically going to hook your dial indicator up, and you're going to put this where this won't drop through the holes, and turn it through and see if it's got run out. If it's got run out, which may be what's going on with your, you know, you can actually measure that, but you can measure it on the back side of the ring gear too if you do it the right way. Measure to determine the proper pinion depth. Uh, Thickness this is a different procedure than the one I'm going to show you later, but this is the way Chrysler does it. And uh, they've got tools, like I say, special tools for that. And so, and I like the way that, that we do it better, but uh, you know, the tools are, you've got to kind of know how to use them. So you've got to use your service information to obtain the details on the service adjustment procedure you're getting ready to do. And see, they've got that, if you look in your book, it's going to tell you how to do all of that. Uh, technical service bulletins provide service procedures and other information not published elsewhere. Always check for TSPs related to the vehicle and symptom you're working on. And basically, when you find a TSP, you might be surprised. And remember, whenever you're looking at these things, once again, if you have blown uh, seals, and you make sure that your vent's not stopped up. 
You know that one little video I put on YouTube that has had so many, like 400,000 views or something, uh, we actually were changing the pinion uh, gear. I mean, see the pinion seal on this Crown Victoria, that light blue one that, that the college owns, and uh, that's what that, that thing's about. And whenever you pull the, uh, the pinion off of there, when you put it back, you got to go right back where you were. That's why you got to count the turns on the nut, put it because you can't just run it up with an impact wrench, or you can't use a torque wrench to, uh, you know, to tighten it up. You basically got to count the turns. I think that one was 16 turns, and you, you know, you, you paint your socket, you paint the nut, you paint the flange, and you put it right back exactly where it was. Now you can find that on YouTube. It's a really important video for this. But whenever Chase was helping me out there, he actually reported. He says when I pulled the the uh, you know, this thing out to check the grease before we ever started working on this seal. When I pull that uh, filler out, it went Phew. There was pressure trapped in the rear end. That meant the vent was stopped up. So we pulled the vent out and there was a little hole in there that we, you know, that was stopped up with crud. And we ran a drill bit through it, you know, just with our finger and put it back in there. And then all that went, and that Crown Victoria hadn't leaked since. And all that, I mean, that was, that was five, six, seven years ago that we did all that kind of stuff. But this stuff is not rocket science, but you do need to understand it before you go flying in there. It's not as simple as just taking parts apart, taking stuff apart and putting it back together. You know, you basically have to have it all set up right and everything. And so uh, I think that's the last slide right there. Yep, there it was. Okay, now wait a minute. Hold on. You know, you know the procedure. What did somebody learn in here that they didn't know before? The vents can make the rear ends leak. Of course, the last thing. <laughs> yeah, the very last thing I said is all I remembered. Okay. The, what about you? A tire can be the same thing as the rear axle. It'll same sound thing. terrible, and you'll swear it's a bearing. What about you? You you pick up something? Usually, you remember something. European axles aren't as good as American axles. Yeah. Well, as far as the rope, the strength of them. Yeah. If you're they're littler, and they can't handle them. They they get beat up. If you're driving a state trooper's vehicle with a state trooper in it, you can still get a ticket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's never okay to speed, okay? That's what we're looking at. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>